Good afternoon. Welcome, Eric, and every one of you that is here. We have something today that Katie did for us, and she made our young one's voice be heard because I believe that today they are going to say what are their needs, and we're going to hear them. I think that the parents and teachers, adults, we all need to hear this. We need to hear their voice, what are their needs, and thank you for the, all the staff that is here from the Long Beach Unified School District. They're trying to do the best that they can. And thank you, welcome. Let's start, Katie. Okay. <laughs> All right, hello. Um, so we have, we like Maria was just saying, we have a, a special treat for you. Um, one of the things that we were talking about um, when we were planning for the year with our CAC meetings is um, we just kind of feel like what's lacking is our student voices. Um, so often we hear from administrators about what we can do for our students. Um, I know a lot of us parents have many thoughts about how we can um, support our students and our children. And, you know, we, we may think we have the best ideas, but we just kind of feel that maybe, maybe we can get some better ideas from our students, the ones who are actually experiencing um, going to school and, and basically to help support them better in their lives. I am very proud of the group that's about to um, present tonight. They are a variety of students. We have, um, we have a student from Cal State Long Beach who's actually employed at Cal State Long Beach who's in a graduate program. We have two ACT students. We have a ninth grader um, in high school and we have a middle schooler that's gonna present tonight from sixth grade. And I mean, just thinking about these students, I mean, when I was in middle school and high school, I was terrified to present. So I think they're so brave and um, I just want them to feel, I told them this is a safe space for them. We're very supportive and that no bullying would be tolerated because some of them were afraid of bullying. I said, this, this will not be tolerated um, in this district. And I told them this is a this is a place that they can share their stories, and we're really, really is, uh, happy to hear it. Actually, very um, and honored that they're sharing. So the per first um, the first story we're going to hear from is from Lindsay Kerr. She's a former student from Cal State Long Beach. I mean, from Long Beach Unified School District, and she currently um, works at Cal State Long Beach. And she's in a graduate program, but she's gonna uh, she's unable to um, do this live tonight. So we're gonna um, listen to her video presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Kerr, and before I begin, I want to thank Jessica Wood from the Bob Murphy Access Center and Shannon McCabe for recommending me for this opportunity. I currently work at the Bob Murphy Access Center as the Instructional Materials Consultant. And in addition to my work at Cal State Long Beach, I am pursuing my master's at credential at San Francisco State University to teach students with visual impairments. But most importantly for tonight's conversation, I am an alumni of LDUSD, who also happens to have a disability. Now, as I just said, I am an alumni of LDUSD with a disability, and you may be wondering, what were the obstacles that I faced? Well, one of the biggest obstacles that I faced was losing a majority of my vision as a result of having three brain surgeries in both my sophomore or my freshman and sophomore year. And this wouldn't have been so difficult had I had the use of both hands, but unfortunately, I do not have the use of both hands. And so my teachers with the visually impaired really had to get creative in the ways in which they were going to teach me Braille. And so one of the ways they did that was having me use a one-handed Brailler, which how that works is, for example, if I was going to use press the letter M, I would use dots one, 
0.3.3.4. And instead of just releasing those keys, I actually have to release them using the space bar. That's how I do it on um, my current note taker. But on a brailler, I actually am able to release them by pressing dot one and dot three and then using dot four to release it. And the importance, the reason that's important is because dots one, two, and three actually lock down to act as my other hand since I don't have the use of both hands. And so whenever I am going to braille a character, I either have to unlock a key on the right, which is dots four, five, and six, or use the space bar to unlock any of the keys on the left, which is dot one, two, and three. Now, another obstacle that I faced as a person with a disability in high, going into higher education was knowing the processes in order to obtain my bachelor's degree. This was an obstacle not only because I wasn't given proper knowledge on how to do this, but also because I am a first generation college student. Now you may be wondering, what are my goals? My long-term goal is to teach students with visual impairments, but I know that I have work to do in order to get there. And one of my short-term goals to get to that point is to be an instructional assistant in a classroom. Now, you may be wondering, well, you probably got that experience in your bachelor's degree. Unfortunately, because I completed my bachelor's degree in summer of 2021 and waited until my senior year to complete my observation hours, I completed them watching videos because I did it during the pandemic. And so because of that, I really have realized that I need classroom experience in order to be able to teach students with visual impairments, but also to help me while I am completing my master's and credential program. You may also be wondering, what does the community need to know in order to best assist students with disabilities? The first thing that I feel like the community really needs to know is that students with disabilities are capable of more than they're often given credit for. For example, when I was a junior in high school, I was told by a special education teacher that I should think about staying in the system until I was 22 because I was having issues passing the California exit exam. And I took that with a grain of salt and went home and told my parents and they said, no, you are going to do any tutoring and any extra assist, any extra um, trainings that you can in order to pass that exam so you can actually go after higher education. I share this story to say that one test doesn't have to define a student, nor should a educator just put a student down because of one exam. And I really think that Standardized tests are not the best answer to show what students are capable of, whether they have a disability or not. The other thing that I think the community needs to know and keep in mind is to give students with disabilities access to people who are working in the similar in a similar field as these students want to work in, but also to give them mentors that have similar disabilities. For example, I am a part of the National Federation of the Blind Student Division. And being a part of this student division has helped me meet many successful professionals, but also college students who are facing similar challenges to my own. And I've actually been able to share my own story through this group of students. I as in talking to these students during one of our committee calls, we were talking about what we were going to post for this year's January issue of the student slate. And the topic of Louis Braille came up because January 4th is um, Louis Braille's birthday and 
National Braille Day. And for us, Braille is one of the ways in which we're able to communicate writ um, written communication. And so we felt it very important to share what it's like for someone like myself to read Braille with one hand, because we often talk about how Braille is um, so impactful for us, but we don't talk about the obstacles that many of us face in order to access it. Now, in closing, I want to encourage both students and parents to continue advocating for their education, because if they do not advocate for their education, no one will. And it's important to help our community understand what we're capable of. Because if we don't, then we're just going to have low expectations thrown at us. And that's not a way to live. And we just need to bring awareness to what we're able to do. So thank you and have a great evening. Okay, that's like my second time or third time hearing the story because I've heard it from her directly. And I have to say that it really, really touches my heart. I'm sure it touches a lot of your hearts. Um, I mean, she really defied the odds. I mean, and she's, she's going for a graduate degree. And for the administrators in this group, I mean, we have a, a teacher here if you want to hire her. <laughs> um, she would, I think she would be great. Um, to, to give somebody like her a chance um, to help. If she, her goal is to become a, an instructor, you know, instructor for the visually impaired. So we have a really great candidate right here. Um, so yes, I am really touched by Lindsay's story. I'm sure everybody's touched too. And um, so brave of her to share. Um, so I kind of want to uh, go over some of the questions. Um, just a little bit of the format. I did give the students questions in advance. And basically, um, these are the questions you're gonna hear me asking them. Um, so they were able to prepare ahead of time because um, I wanted them to feel really comfortable and they're gonna share what they feel comfortable sharing. I have already told them they don't have to share anything too personal if they don't feel comfortable. So the next two speakers is Anna Dominguez and Salvador. They're going to speak together, and they're um, they're both our ACP students. Okay, so the first question is: uh, Tell us about yourself, about your background, um, your name, your grade or education level, your disability. If you would like to share that, any hobbies or any interesting facts about you. Hello, my name is Salvador Vizcaya. I'm in the Akpanga. Uh, my disability is my reading and my writing. And uh, my hobbies are like cooking and baking. And that's it. Anna? Hi, Anna. The same question. Tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background. Are you here, Anna? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you. So you could tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what grade you're in or level education, um, your hobbies, any interesting facts about yourself, your disability, um, if you want to share or not. I have ADHD, but I also have problems with my math problems as well. Any Italy. What was that? I have problems with my math problem. Was I have problems with math, so it's probably my disability. And what are your uh, favorite things to do, hobbies? Um, um, I like doing makeup on myself sometimes, even when I'm going out to eat. Oh, that's nice. All right. Um, the next question is, what challenges have you faced and how, how did you overcome them? How did you get through tough times? I have two jobs. I, my job is a salsa place called Fina's Kitchen. 
And then my second one is a a school where we work in the cafeteria and pack lunch, pack lunches for kids. Mm. It's hard, you know, I have stress a lot, but I at least I try my best and keep over, push myself, and that's it. That's really challenging balancing two jobs. I've done it before. It's really a really challenging. So how do you how do you how do you how are you able to do it? Um uh, I take a you know, breathing, you know, breathe. To, you know, and do it slow, not no rush, you know, not do it fast. Take your time. Very good. Anna, um, what challenges have you faced and how did you overcome them? Um well in my in my dance class I was rejected from one of my from the classmates I had, they wouldn't dance with me, so I had to do my um my dance project by myself. That's the and as it, it was hard for me because um because of my disability, and it hurt my feelings a lot and uh, affected my feelings too. But I fought it and. Did my best I could with my heart. That's really good. Where um, is there anything else that helped you through that tough time? When you're going through that tough time, when when they weren't including you in the dance. Well, I didn't. I just thought of my dad the most. Your dad's really supportive of you. My mom too, and my dad passed away. Oh. Oh. But that that helps give you some strength. It's okay. good. Because he wanted to go see me dance, but he couldn't because so, he always ended up in the hospital. Yeah. So you try to you try to um, be around people that are supportive of you. Is that how you? get through times like that, yes. like try to associate with the people that are supportive of you that are, you know, they're, they're um, helping you and cheering you on and yeah. yes, very good. Um, where are you now in your life and what are your future dreams? I still in the app program, but my dream is to be a chef. And my other day, my second dream, I want to be a baker. And that's it. Try to get, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be able to do your dream. You sound really passionate about it. And people, if they're that passionate, they do really well. Yeah. So I have no doubt that you're going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Anna. What are you, where are you now in your life and what are your future dreams and hopes? Well, right now I'm in an app program, but, but I'm already uh, achieving my dream of becoming a makeup artist by taking makeup classes. That's awesome. I can use some pointers. I can use some pointers from you. I um, don't know how to do makeup at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> So maybe you could be my makeup artist. Okay. Yeah. Um, the last, unless you want to elaborate any more on that, uh, but the last question, and I think this is a real, this is the one that we really would like to know, because this is something that um, to better help and support you. What do you want from your community? Community, like what what do you want from your family, your friends, your student peers to know in order to help um, to help you better? How can we be? Um, how can we be more supportive? I tell you, I, I always should be shy to people, but I'd be brave to talk to all, all those people. But my dad told me to never give up. And that's it. 
That's definitely a great motto to, to live by, to don't mm -hmm. And is there anything else that we can help with you? Just keep sharing for you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Anna, what would yeah. you like, what would you like your community to know, like your family, your friends, or your student peers, and in, in order to help you better, to better support you? Uh, except people with a special disability, that both teachers and students have respect for people who have more who has more support in research, work, more and training for teachers who has who trust that we can do much more in society. That's um, I think that's an important one to actually believe in students that have disabilities and don't limit them. I, I mean, listening to Lindsay's um, presentation, she actually pointed that out too. Um, it seems to be a common theme. Um, we could we could do better by being accepting and to uh, be more encouraging. Um, yeah, because um, I used to go to Millican High School when I was in the, my ninth grade year. And um, one of the teachers called me a spoiled brat behind my back because one of my friends told me that he heard he heard her said that wow and, uh, yeah i um actually agree with you um i mean not to say anything but the teachers definitely could use more training um especially um general ed teachers um it's a little bit more challenging, I know, having kids with disabilities in their classes, but um, we still have a long way to go with um, how to make students with disabilities to feel more included. So I do feel, I, I've seen it as a parent, but hearing it from you guys, it sounds like it's still pretty, like we could definitely use more training. So, and I, I know the school is working on training, but it's good for them to hear about it tonight um, because yeah, we, we definitely can use more um, more help with that. Even even special ed teachers too, not just the general ed teachers. Um, is there anything else that you both would like to share? I think that's all. You did, both of you did such a fantastic job. Thank you. Both nervous, but you guys did awesome. I am, yeah. it's an honor hearing from you. We thank you so much. I mean, it's incredibly brave for both of you to speak together. I'm glad you both have each other as best friends. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for being a part of tonight. And we are definitely learning from you. Um, you're thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. Inspirational. And I can't wait to hear about when you're a chef. And I can't wait to hear when you're a makeup artist. Yeah. Okay. Keep me keep us posted. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Um, our next student is Uriel Perez. He's a ninth sí. grader. He's in high school. Uh, ¿Le puedes decir que Uriel tiene su escrito, se siente más confortable? Uh, I just want to let you know that he, uh, Uriel has his notes. And he'll start when you say to start, but he has all his um, presentation and writing. Okay. All right. We're 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 ready to hear from him. Welcome, Uriel. Ready? Listo? Ya I puedes see. empezar. Okay. Preséntate. All right. Hello. My name is Uriel Perez. I am an, I'm a 14 year old kid and I go to And my current school that I go right now is all high school. When I was in preschool, I was in a special ed class called MS class. But when I was in, I went to third grade, I was translated 
to a different class called MM. And I also went and I also went to a generation education. With support. I know I am different than most kids. But I am determined that with support of with the support of people and my own hate this better. <laughs> But with I am determined that with the support of of people and my family, I was able to overcome my challenges in the future i want I want to join the military and And I soon, and then as soon as I retire from the military, I'm gonna become a state governor for California. <laughs> a state governor from California, and then later, and while doing the state governor, I will move. I'm going to move from L.A. to the capital city of California. What what would I like to suggest when I place when I'm placing students into special ed class is to be careful not to be in the to, to not be in a place where kids are in the wrong class because that's ex that's exactly what happened to me. I would also like to adjust for the testing to be be a lot better and more understandable. I mean, the testing shouldn't be harsh. Shouldn't be an hour long. Should have been harsh and an hour long with no with no rest in between. And even if so, Si escucha? Que sigue? Okay, sigue. All right, I was, I was saying the testing should have been an hour long. Okay. I just thought of something. Are you guys hearing him speak in English? Yes. Yeah? Okay, good. Puede continuar? Testing should have been an hour, more than an hour's long, with no breaks. And even if so, it should be where um, we can, we had to sit there, do nothing without talking to our friends, which are in between. It would also like the teachers to be more understandable with our phones. Because at the time that we aren't aware, of our phones, of a single sound from something that we forget just one. we should have been pushed we should have been punished harshly for our mistakes 
for literally nothing. That's it. All right. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much, Thanks Uriel. for the conversation. Thank you so much for sharing. Excellent job. Thank you. That was so brave. Thank you so much. And actually, I can't wait until you're the governor of California. Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? Actually, our current governor has dyslexia. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but he actually has a disability. So Governor Newsom has dyslexia, so it is completely possible for you to become governor, okay? And then I agree with you and, uh, and the other speakers about the standardized testing. That does not test a student's potential. It actually is not, shouldn't be the, the thing that people have to, have to get through because a test doesn't test your full potential. So yes, the testing is really hard. And I have to say, I'm not the best test taker. I've never been a great test taker, but I became a nurse. So it's definitely possible to, to do your dreams. And, and thank you ahead of time for wanting to join the service too. How, I mean, right. you, you are an amazing person. Thank I sometimes don't like somebody calling me a great person. I just, just prefer to be an okay person. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you're you're pretty impressive. You're yeah, really but impressive. Uh, but but you know maybe you'll get used to the compliments. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Uriel. All right. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay. Our next speaker is going to be Carla Martinez uh, Castellanos. And she's a and she's in middle school and she's in sixth grade. Is Carla on? Yes, I'm here. Hi, hey, Carla. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing tonight. You're welcome. I'm um, I'm in awe of you because when I was in middle school, there was no way I would have been able to do this kind of speaking. So. So the first question is to tell us a little bit about yourself, about your, your what grade you're in, um, your disability, share that, any hobbies or any interesting facts about yourself. Yes, well, my name is Carla Martinez, and one of my disabilities are ELA and writing and reading because it's just too hard for me to be reading those, especially when it comes to becoming on May of expect test, because we have to read like, I think like 10 or more or less of them. And to me, they're very hard to do because of my disability. And one of my favorite, Hobbies are um, playing basketball with my team and going out with my family. Are you currently playing basketball? Yeah. Do you want to share more about your basketball experience? If you were telling me something that I think a lot of us would like to hear about. Yes, well, I actually have a team named Someone Get the Big, and I just happen to um, be able to play and participate in the team. And we've won two trophies, but I own one and a one that goes around your neck. And I have. Um, a teammate that has that owns the other one, the other trophy that broke, unfortunately, because she tried getting something, but it tilted and it fell, so it broke.
but I have mine up high where my my siblings can't get it. Oh, <laughs> I get it. The little the little siblings like to break stuff. Um, so you're pretty good at you're pretty good at basketball. Winning a couple of trophies or a medal and a trophy. That's awesome. Yeah. Can you um is there anything else you would like to tell us about yourself? Um I think that's all that I have. Okay. Um the second question is what are something that that was really tough for you? Like what is something that's been really tough that you for you and how did you get through that tough time? How did you get through it? Well, as I said, that ELA is hard for me, but I would raise my hand and ask teacher of what what exactly did it mean for me to um, question my answer before um, before answering it. So I told him what it means, and he would tell me. So then I knew what it means to find the correct answer of my ELA questions. So you're not afraid to ask for help? Well, sometimes I am, but I get over with it and I just say I just need some help, so I have to tell my teachers. That's actually a really good skill, um, Carla, because there's a lot of adults that are afraid to ask for help when they need it. And you're you're learning it so so early. So that's a really great skill. Definitely never be afraid to ask for help. I ask for help all the time at work if I need it. Okay. Where are you? So the third question is, is where are you at now in your life? And what are your future dreams? Well, one of my um, future dreams are becoming a very good basketball player and Coming like like from Sparks players or or the Lakers because I've won Staples Center twice with my team to go watch games by Storm at Sparks and it was actually a very good game and it was actually interested in me for. By giving me hands help to shoot better and of my um my teammates, like they wanted to go more and I think we are going to go again, but this time we're going to go with my um family. But my siblings are gonna stay with with probably some of my aunties because they walk around too much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of hard to be at the Staples Center and not, and uh, walk around a lot. But I mean, being a woman basketball player, that is that is pretty awesome. Can't wait to watch you play. Last, the last question is: What do you want from your community? What do you want your family, your friends, your your fellow students in your school? What do you want them to know? in order for us to be, um, in order to uh, better support you? What can we do to help you? Well, I just want them to know that what I mostly need help on so that one day they can help me on of what I need to. Like if they would come to like testing or um, practicing with like, together I would ask help for some things that I don't understand in my school. So I would just ask them out. Like if it would be my homework, I would ask my big sister or my dad because my mom doesn't really understand um some of the things that I learn. So I just do tell my parents and my siblings to help me out um, what I need to, and also my friends and my teachers and my classmates. Wow. 
So you know how to ask for help. And so if you if you tell your family or your friends that you need help, that I hope they're willing to help you. It sounds like you probably have a lot of friends. You sound like you're pretty friendly. Yeah. You have a couple of good ones, right? Yes. That's good. You only need like one or two good friends. You don't need a whole lot of friends. But it's great that you um that you're, you're to me you're do you're rocking this. You know exactly what to do. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. Thank you so much, um, Carla. We're so honored to have you. Uh, you're our youngest speaker, and it's great to hear from from our students because we do want to learn how to be more supportive and how we can better help you. So thank you so much for sharing. We're really honored to hear from you tonight. Really, it really touches our hearts. Thank you. You should be proud of yourself too, because we're super proud of you. You did great. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more speaker. Um, the next speaker will be Daniela. Uh, she wants to give us an update. She spoke at our last uh, CAC meeting last year. Um, and she would like to give us a new update about what's going on with her. So, um, Daniela, when you're ready, we're ready. Maria, is Daniela on? I found Daniela. She's on. Okay, great. Daniela, thank you for very much for coming on tonight to share your story and to um, give us an update about what what's going on with you now. We can't wait to hear from you. Hello, my name is Daniela. I'm here. My My education started in a special class, then I went in a regular class in fifth grade. I'm now at Browning High School in 12th grade. I have a GPA of three point five and I'm a student with with cerebral palsy. My challenge was wanting to be in a general class, but when I went to a general class, I didn't really have that much help. I had to work harder than other students Right now in my life, I am very confused. Because I am 18 years old and the school wants me to be in charge of my IP. And that and that causes me anxiety even 
more because I went to a notary and I gave the rights to my mom for her to handle. to handle my IP and the district rejected the letter. My hopes are that the district believes more in kids with special needs and and that the district won't make us won't make us feel different because we have dreams. I want my community to give us the opportunity to be heard that with every kid that has support academically they will be able to reach their goals the district needs to help the students more academically. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, very, I'm very proud of you. I was, um, I know the last time you spoke, you said you were applying for colleges or were you, you're in 11th grade or are you in 12th grade? In 12th grade. So you're, yeah, so you're a senior this year. So you're going to be applying to colleges, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you've got a, you're obviously a pretty good student with that kind of GPA and you're, you're able to speak tonight, very courageous. And we really appreciate you being here. Is there anything else you would like us to know? Or I think that's a really good statement. Like, what are your hopes for the future for yourself? Um, um, I want to be a physical therapist. Wow. I, I believe you're going to be able to do that. Did you um, need physical therapy when you were a kid? Yes. I imagine you needed some therapy, so you know exactly what it's like, and I think you'll be a great physical therapist because you've, you've been there as a patient. Can't wait to have you in the healthcare industry with us. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you for wanting to share your story and your update. And um, that was very courageous of you. And I hope um, everybody was listening to you tonight. Because um, we definitely want to learn how to better support um, our students. That's why we're here. We really want to learn how to support you and all the, all the students in um, Long Beach Unified. So thank you so much. So um, that was the conclusion of our neurodiversity panel for tonight. I do want to let you know that this is just the beginning. Uh, we actually would like to have like maybe one to two students every CAC meeting because we really want students to be involved. Um, we need their voices in our meetings. They're the one, they're the whole reason why we're even here tonight, right? So um, we're all here because we want to do better for them, but we definitely need to, to hear from them so we can um, better assist them. So don't be surprised in our future, um, our future meetings for this year. We're definitely going to have um, some more. Um, we actually had a lot of students volunteer. I just, we just couldn't fit everybody tonight on the panel. I mean, I was so amazed. So um, I was like, wow. So I had to actually turn down students for tonight 
So we're going to have them in the future meetings. Um, so you will be hearing more. Um, the next part of our um, presentations for tonight is hearing from um, two colleges. We're going to hear from Long Beach City College and um, Cal State Long Beach about um, what programs they offer disabled students in higher education. I have, um, I'm a first generation. I was the first one in my family to go to college. And so I got my ADN degree at a junior college. So I can't speak high enough for junior colleges. And I did later on transfer to Cal State Long Beach. So I'm an alumni from Cal State Long Beach nursing, um, nursing school too. So I'm very enthusiastic to hear from our speakers tonight. Um, so I'm going to have Long Beach City College present first. It's going to be um, April McLaughlin and Veronica and, and uh, Joku Carter. Um, they're both going to present from Long Beach City College. Um, they're, um, they both work in the Disabled Student Program and Services. And Veronica is going to be the first one to present. She's a counselor there. April and Veronica, are you on? Yes, we're here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so again, thank you so much for inviting us. My name is Veronica and Joku Carter. I'm a DSPS counselor here at Long Beach City, and I'll be presenting alongside April McLaughlin, our DSPS um, disability specialist. Um, here at Long Beach City, DSPS, or otherwise known as Disabled Student Program and Services, is the designated office on campus who provides accommodations and services for students with disabilities here at the college. Our goal is to provide services to ensure equal access to educational programs and facilities here at the college for all students with disabilities. Um, and it includes students with a range of diagnosis, including students with learning disabilities, mental health diagnosis, um, acquired brain injury, deaf and hard of hearing, et cetera. Um, we even have a category for other disabilities, which includes any medical condition that may be impacting a person's learning. So that could be anything from an athlete who has a concussion and needs temporary accommodations, um, someone who's pregnant and needs temporary accommodations. Just recently, we were um, approved to provide services for students who are experiencing long haul COVID symptoms. Um, so again, if any student on campus is experiencing um, difficulty due to a medical condition, they are welcome to contact our office. Last year, we served over 2,400 students within our office. Um, so that's about 10% of the population here at Long Beach City. Um, but we know that there are probably many more students around the campus who are um, experiencing um, challenges. And again, we make every effort to do outreach and to encourage students to really reach out to us so that we can help them succeed. As you know, there are quite a few differences between the services that are offered at the high school level as opposed to the college level. Um, just to give you a general idea, some of the differences, obviously under um, within the high school level, uh, the services are governed by IDEA, but at the college level, our services are governed by ADA and Section 504, as well as Title V of the uh, Education Code. Um, at the high school level, in many ways, parents play a very important role by advocating for st uh, their students, um, initiating requests for services, participating in the IEP process, and continuing to work with the schools to ensure the students have the accommodations and modifications that they uh, would benefit from. But at the college level, um, once the student turns 18, they are now considered an adult student. So it's really their responsibility to initiate the request for services by contacting our office and providing documentation, verifying their disability. Um, we work with the students um, to ensure that they receive an academic accommodation plan. Um, under uh, ADA, students are entitled to the right to privacy and confidentiality. So for that reason, parents do not automatically have access to uh, student records, unless the student provides written consent 
or our office is provided a copy of a court approved conservatorship documentation. Um, but I will tell you that in our office, we work very closely with our students to support them, to give them to tools to be able to self advocate. We work, we do provide campus liaison, liaison services because we do recognize that that transition from high school to college is not easy. And students do not necessarily have the, uh, the tools and the confidence right away. So we do work very closely with students and with our faculty to ensure the services are provided and our students receive reasonable accommodations in each of their classes. Um, it is important that we know FERPA, uh, many of you may be familiar with this, this is the law that protects the student's right to privacy. And I bring this up because I know how much parents really want to continue to be involved. And so it is important that number one, we make sure students understand their rights under the law, that they do have a right to request a copy of their records at any time. Um, but also if a parent wants to continue to be involved, there are tools available that would allow that to happen, whether it's uh, within the DSPS office, there is a consent for release form that would need to be completed by the student and filed in our office. But as well as with the missions and records, there is a separate FERPA form that can be filed with that office. Um, and again, this comes up a lot, especially when parents are supporting students by helping with financial aid or perhaps have other questions. Um, and we often hear that sometimes that parents call the admissions office and they're told that they're not um, allowed to release information to uh, the parent. Um, again, there are forms available that can help facilitate that. But again, ultimately our goal is to ensure that students have the tools they need so that they can feel confident moving forward in their classes and eventually into the workplace. Um, in order to qualify for services here at DSPS, first a student must apply to the college, obtain um, an ID number, and attend a DSPS orientation. We do provide, or we do engage in high school outreach during the spring semesters, where we um, either go out to the high schools and host orientations. Uh, during this time of remote instruction, we've provided the orientation via Zoom. Once the orientation is complete, the student is able to schedule an appointment with the counselor to complete their intake, as well as to um, obtain an academic accommodation plan. When they attend the intake, we do ask that they provide verification of disability, so an IEP or some type of medical documentation as evidence of the diagnosis. Um, examples of some of the reasonable accommodations that we do offer at our office include um, academic counseling, career counseling, disability management. Um, we do provide uh, support for student education planning. Um, we do provide um, adaptive furniture, note-taking assistance, um, interpreter services for students who may require sign language support or access to a captioner, a priority enrollment, et cetera. Uh, we also have a high tech center on campus, which is a lab for assistive technology. So if a student wanted to check out equipment or utilize equipment on campus, that is available to students. Um, it is important to note that again, when we meet with the student, we always try to consider what is a reasonable accommodation um, because there are situations where sometimes a request may be made and there are certain services that do not fall within that reasonable range. So again, it's just important to keep in mind that our goal is to ensure access um, to the course curriculum and campus facilities. But if there is a request that is made that may lower the academic standards or pose a health or safety um, risk, uh, that may be a circumstance where we may not be able to necessarily approve the request. So we do take an individualized support or individualized approach when working with students to determine again, what is reasonable and what is not a reasonable request. Next, we are going to discuss specialized supports and programs. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to April at this time. Thank you, Veronica. So we do have a variety of supports in place and programs to help our students um, to provide them with advice, information, assistance, a variety of them. And I'm gonna go over um, supports for deaf and hard of hearing students. We have a program that's college to career, our TRIO and GO project, um, and our dual enrollment prog um, program for students coming in from high school. 
So for our students who are deaf and hard of hearing, we have American Sign Language services that we provide in the classroom. It's generally two sign language interpreters to ensure that the student is receiving all the information that is spoken in the classroom. That student also receives a note taker for all written materials that's um, written on the board for the student. We also have um, captioning in the classroom for students who may not know American Sign Language and they have a um, computer device that they use directly in the classroom with them. So everything that's being said, it's being typed in and the students are able to read it so that they could still receive all the same um, information that any other hearing student would receive. College to Career is a um, fully integrated program that we have for um, students coming in. Um, these students that are part of College to Career, they really need to be a part of Harbor Regional Center and they need to be referred to our program by their Harbor Regional Center um, pro um, counselor. Um, these students live independently and it's generally two to a room. Um, they also, um, fully participate in the campus. They have um, educational coaches that work one-on-one -on -one with them so that they can um, ensure that they are successful in their classes. They um, receive career development um, leading to um, employment. So it's a good full scope for these students. And a lot of them get to work either on campus or off campus. And the classes that they're taking is toward their career goal. So to be eligible for college to career, um, you need to be a part of the Harbor Regional Center program right there, 18 years of age, have graduated from high school. They have to demonstrate not only an interest to attend college, but they also have to have an interest for um, a career goal and um, to receive an AA or a vocational certificate. Um, so this is a very good program for um, students. So they have to have the desire to work. Um, so the C2C, oh, oh that's okay, TRIO. <laughs> so TRIO is a transfer program. TRIO is a transfer program that we have specifically for our DSPS students who plan on transferring to a four-year college or university. Um, the program is designed to increase the retention, um, graduation and transfer of students with disabilities. Primary goal is student participation to successfully graduate with associate degree or tra and transfer. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so there, um, they have academic transfer, financial aid, career counseling. They have tutoring. Um, they take their students on cultural enrichment field trips to get them acclimated to things that's going on outside of their um, regular lives. They um, work with the students to um, apply for scholarships. They um, have study and life skill workshops. Um, they also not only um, um, refer to other colleges and help with the application process, but they also tour the other colleges to make sure that's the college they wanna go to. So TRIO is a good um, program for um, students who plan on transferring to a four-year college or university. Okay, so if you like to apply for TRIO, all the information is there. Um, you can contact DSPS. We can give you the information. We'll hold it up for a moment. So if anybody want to take a picture of it or write anything down, they're located on our Pacific Coast campus physically, but they generally have a counselor at both campuses to assist students. Early College Pathways Partnership is for students who are in the 11th and 12th grade who would like to attend college early. It's a very good program for students. It's a dual enrollment program um, where the students 
take classes at the high school and at the college and get a jump ahead on the rest of the other students. Um, we do have two different types of dual enrollment programs. Do you have that on your next screen? Um, okay. So we do have two different types of dual enrollment programs. And one, the student can enroll in any type of classes that they want. Then the other one is the pathways where they have specific classes that the students need to take to be able to get a specific degree or transfer to a four-year college or university. Um, they generally get free books. The enrollment is no cost to them. Um, they also get um, specialized tutoring services on campus. They are a part of group with other high school, I mean, high school students so that they could be successful around their peers that they are already adjusted to. And then they also integrated with the college students to get them ready for being around college students as well. Um, they receive a lot of support while they attend in Long Beach City College um, classes. Um, then they will receive their certificate and or, or degree toward whatever major that they're, they're going for. And they generally finish quicker than their peers that they're in high school with. Any questions? I have a question. Thank you, April, um, for presenting. What is the percentage of... Um, do you have any idea what the percentage of disabled students that transfer to a four-year school from Long Beach City College? I know I didn't ask this ahead of time, so you might not know offhand, but I'm just curious. That's a good question. I don't know the exact percentage um, in comparison to our total number, um, but I will say, you know, we were just looking at the statistics at our data. And I know that there was a significant increase this last year with something like a 29% increase of the number of students who transferred, um, which was very exciting considering we've wow. been taking class, offering classes remotely. Um, and so we were concerned that there would be a dip in the number of students who transfer, but there was actually an increase um, in the 2021 year in comparison to the previous year. Um, so I don't know the total percentage. I do know that it's a pretty broad spread of academic goals. There are many students who are pursuing certificates and associates and then entering the workforce. Um, but again, we also have many that are interested in transfer as well. So very good. I, um, personally think, I mean, I had a, I don't want to say anything bad, but I had a really great experience at El Camino College. I mean, some of my professors, I felt like I had a really great educational experience. So I know it's, you get a pretty good solid um, education from a junior college. And personally, I would love for my two sons to go to a junior college, uh, Long Beach City College first, <laughs> um, <laughs> probably for selfish reasons. No, not for selfish reasons, because I feel like, to be honest with you, you get the kind of same, you get a really great education. You don't have to pay as much. And exactly. I, and um it's like basically the same classes anyways, the general ed classes. So yeah. I'm a very, very strong supporter of the junior colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I mean, I think the TRIO is the TRIO program, the transfer program to the yes. four-year to get the yes. kids ready to go transfer to a four, four-year college. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a great program that you guys have. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely encourage all students to participate. So I would like to, since you're on right now, I'd like to open this up to general questions from um, from other parents, because we have time. Okay. I think there's a question on the um, on the chat, and uh, it says, "How do you verify a disability?" I think you mentioned that it needs to be self um, self uh, declared, but do mm -hmm. you verify it and how? Okay, that's a great question. So under Title V, um, we can verify disability in three ways. One is with documentation. So whether it's an IEP or a medical record, um, that can serve as one form. Another is through observation. So in some cases, we have students who have a physical disability that we're able to observe. Um, and then the third form is through professional judgment. And so professional judgment is a situation um, where Perhaps a student doesn't have documentation, um, but based on the interactive process, meaning the during the intake process, 
Um, the student is able to provide enough information um, that we can determine that there's a high likelihood of a diagnosis. We can approve them for accommodations. Uh, typically in that circumstance, um, what we've done in the past is perhaps approve a student for temporary services pending documentation. Um, another circumstance is we do provide learning disability testing within our office. So let's say a student does not have a diagnosis, but they suspect they may have a learning disability. Um, they can request testing and we can provide temporary accommodations um, during that time, uh, perhaps for a semester while we're waiting for the assessment to be completed. And then at that time, we determine whether to continue services or not. I would like to add to that for an example. Now, Veronica is the counselor who approved the accommodations based on a type of disability. But I would like to give you an example. So let's say I was a student that came to the school and I was looking for accommodations from DSPS. So once I complete the orientation and I brought my documentation into Veronica, and let's say I've been a dishwasher or a hairdresser doing something repetitiously like combing hair or washing dishes, and I got carpal tunnel in my arm. Well, if I didn't have documentation when I met Veronica, she would ask me to go to my doctor and get documentation. Well, mm -hmm. the documentation that I receive from my doctor may state that I have carpal tunnel, and then it may also state that I can't lift five pounds for a certain period of time or just the maximum amount of weight I could lift. So Veronica would take that documentation and then see how it would affect, affect me in the school setting. Mm -hmm. And then she would provide accommodations to bring up my limitation so that I could be on an equal playing field with other students who don't have that disability. So one of the accommodations she may provide me would be a note taker because I may not be able to write notes as fast as other students or testing accommodations because when it's time to take those time tests, I might not be able to complete my tests within the time frame. Yeah. Thank you, April, for sharing that because, yes, when we uh, complete the intake process, we always look at, well, what are the educational limitations that are identified? And based on that, we determine what accommodations we can approve. Um, there was a question in the chat regarding uh, what does the accommodation plan look like? So just to give you all an idea, uh, the accommodation plan... Again, we'll identify, it will list the identified education. Perdón, que tengo, uh, para tomar lista, perdón, tengo que interrumpir. Hay un IPA que no tiene nombre y un S que me gustaría si pueden poner sus nombres para poder tomar lista. Hi, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need to go ahead and take roll. There's an iPad that doesn't have a name and someone else. Um, and then if you could just let me know. Limitations um, that have been identified, whether it's difficulty processing uh, textbooks, processing lecture, um, difficulty taking tests in a traditional manner, uh, difficulty uh, completing notes. And then based on that, we will have the approved accommodations. So perhaps it's uh, note-taking services, audio recording of lectures, um, access to an in-class aid, um, extra time on tests, being able to take your test within a distraction-free setting. Um, sometimes it's priority seating. Sometimes it's adaptive furniture. We have extra tutoring time for students. Um, again, we will list whatever the approved accommodations are on that plan. Um, and then again, um, if the plan will be finalized. And it is important to note that this plan is created during the initial intake process. If um, your limitations change over the course of your enrollment, a student can request a reevaluation at any time, and we can always update that accommodation plan. And I would like to also add that um, Veronica did not mention that the student's specific disability is listed on that accommodation plan. We keep that confidential. Yes. Yes. Good point. Thank you for sharing that. And I see a hand raised. Robin, look at it. Hi. Thank you so much, both of you, for, for presenting and um, Katie and the board. This is a fantastic idea. I have, I have two questions. The first one is, I'm very glad that you talked about the dual enrollment um, because I, I often have wondered if that would be available to my kid. 
And so if my kid is in an LBUSD student um, doing the dual enrollment, because he's still a high school student, he'll get the high school support or because he's on campus at LBUS, I mean, LBCC, will he not get those supports or like, would he have to start the DPSP process in high school? Okay, I could answer that. So we are connected with the dual enrollment program where when they have the students fill out the application, there should have been a question in there to ask if the student um, have an IEP or a 504 plan. And if the student says yes, then they re would refer those students to our program and get them connected. Because remember, the students need to come to us. So they would connect the students to our program and then we would offer the students the orientation, the DSPS orientation and then an intake appointment. And in the intake appointment through the communication with the counselor, like Veronica said, then she would approve the services based on the documentation that's provided. Mm -hmm. And so then they would receive the idea. DSPS supports at the college as well. Okay, so it's a good idea to, for them to do this because then they're like getting, they're, they're being supported in high school, but they're also mm -hmm. being introduced to the college support. Yeah. at the cool. same time i mean it seems oh maybe it is overwhelming but it it does seem like a great idea yeah. and and then my my second question is is as a parent and you know an involved parent i feel that right now it feels like um like the iep and services are really i'm driven by you know fape and and, and all that mm -hmm. and what you're saying is for the college level support mm -hmm. it's is the is the sort of machine driving the services is it just ada that since there's not it's not idea like mm -hmm. and it's yeah. it's really about independence and about the person and that kind of that like it's not like we can't you know think that we're just all going to hire lawyers it's, it's, <laughs> it's a different it's a different machine right yes so post-secondary um, is governed by ADA, Section 504, as well as Title V of Student Education Code. So again, students are still entitled to services um, and they are able to receive, again, whatever services and accommodations will ensure equal access. Um, but yes, the services will definitely look a little different since um, IDA is definitely a different law. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, Robin, I know our next speaker is going to touch up on that, um, those questions, like the difference between, you know, K through 12 and um, going to college. But thank, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, her name is Jessica Wood, and she's an associate director from Cal State Long Beach. Thank you so much, April and Veronica, for sharing tonight. Um, I, I know a lot of our, our kids will probably end up at Long Beach City College. Um, so I'm super excited that, to have you here tonight and thank you so much, appreciate it. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I do see that uh, Judy has her hand up. I don't know if we wanna just backtrack really quickly so she oh, can squeeze her question in. Sure, sure. Go for it, Judy. I'll get my uh, presentation queued up. Jessica, are we now best friends? Possibly. <laughs> You're really good. Thank you. Um, I just had a question to the presenters. How soon should a 12th grader connect with the LBCC programs um, to potentially enter in uh, the fall of 22? So our first year experience team actually begins outreach during the fall semesters to our high school partners. So the high school should already begin receiving information from the um, from our office and we provide information to start the process for students to begin applying to the college and identify or, you know, completing the uh, placements, etc. In the spring semester is when DSPS then does outreach to begin the orientation and the intakes. Um, so I would say 
towards the end of the fall semester and then for sure during the spring semester um, is a good time to complete the application and to also complete the intake because priority registration for the fall semester begins, oh gosh, April, can you help me? Is, is it it generally begins in May. They've moved it around, but in May. Okay. So we just want to make sure students have their um, ID numbers and they also have been identified as DSPS early so that when priority registration comes, the student is ready to register for classes. And do you only do outreach to the comprehensive high schools or do you also go deeper into the specialized programs that may be located at other campuses? Um, do you want to answer that, April? I think you would know better than me. Um, we mostly go to um, the, the um, high schools. We go to like Cabrillo, Wilson, Milliken, um, Jordan. Um, um, we go to um, McBride. Um, we've outreached to okay, quite so a few of them, okay. even EPHS. Can I request that you expand that and go to Tucker? Because you're missing. Oh, I've been to Tucker with Julie. I think she retired. Uh, it no, there? it's with Miss Leonard's, with Brandy Leonard's. Leonard's? Okay. She has I'll a write whole that down. class of kids that are um, college ready and on a diploma track who would thrive with these programs. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you for telling us that. Because yeah, if we are aware of an additional school that, you know, where students will benefit, we will absolutely include that. So yeah, it's yeah. she's with she um she's basically Beach High School, but it's located okay. at Tucker now and her class is a hundred percent high functioning ASD. Okay. Um, so it's the perfect population and my child is in there. So I want to make sure he gets connected early and in the right way. And you guys have the keys to all of that. Okay. Well, I do the outreach to the high school, so I will okay. definitely reach out to her. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Judy, for speaking up. Appreciate that. You're welcome. All righty, let me just pop this up here. Okay, oh, and then everyone's thumbnails gets really small, of course. Um, hi again, everybody. My name is Jessica Wood, she, her pronouns. I am the Associate Director over at the Bob Murphy Access Center at California State University, Long Beach. Uh, we were previously referred to as Disabled Student Services. So if you're wondering what entity I am with, I am with that entity. We just have a rename um, in recent years. Um, our current mission statement at the beach is that we believe in the inherent strength of diversity, uh, believing in a barrier free world and the right to equal access and opportunity. Um, through advocacy and empowerment, we are committed to helping students build confidence while raising the collective awareness of campus community about the value of differences. So that is our current operating mission statement. Um, we're actually in the process of updating it, but this is the current published mission statement. Um, just some fun facts. I'm sorry, Jessica, really quick. I'm Sorry to sure. interrupt. Can you speak a little bit slower because we have interpreters for? Oh, sure, absolutely. Thanks for letting right, me know. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, we do have some fun facts um, for you all, just so you can get a little bit of context about our program. So we celebrated our 45th anniversary as a department or a services program in 2018. Uh, in the academic year 2021, so this past academic year, we had 1,867 undergraduate and graduate students registered with our BMAC program. And since 1973, we have had 11,619 folks graduate from, um, from BMAC or from Disabled Student Services. And we do have strong donor and alumni support. So in our program, um, you will often see or hear about um, names that you have heard before. And they're often our, our alumni who come back to support us um, as donors or as just, you know, general um, advocates um, and community supporters. 
So what I have here on this slide is our disability breakdown at CSULB as of, um, this was for February of spring 2021. So, um, as you saw on the last slide, our, our numbers for last semester, they actually grew closer to the 1850 mark or 1900 mark. But at this point in time where this pie chart was uh, captured, we were at 1626 students enrolled as of February, 2021. Um, of the total B, uh, CSULB student population, which at that time was 36,191, um, about 5% of that total student population was registered with the BMAC office. Um, but just like Veronica and April were stating in their presentation, it's, it's really interesting to think about, you know, how many more students with disabilities are on our campus who either have not disclosed or have not formally registered with our office. Um, that number is probably much higher. That percentage is probably much higher in reality but these are how many students have identified with us formally and have registered with our office. Um, our disability breakdown here at the beach, and this is still pretty consistent, even though this is a figure from last semester, this is still very consistent with our, um, our typical numbers. Um, our largest percentage of disability breakdown category would definitely be um, folks with psychological diagnoses. So um, students who may have uh, clinical depression, generalized anxiety disorder, or other similar impacts. Um, another large percentage of our population are students who are diagnosed with ADHD or ADD. Um, and kind of trailing behind that are other functional limitations. So that can be any other disability that impacts uh, one or more daily life functions that doesn't fall into one of these other more um, specific or discrete categories. Um, and then we also have a fair percentage of students uh, on our campus with learning disabilities. Um, and those kind of round out our main categories or our, our greatest percentage, I should say, of, of folks enrolled. Um, and then we also have students identified on, you know, the autism spectrum or with an autism spectrum disorder, um, acquired brain injury, uh, students who have various visual impairments, um, mobility limitations, our deaf and our hard of hearing students, as well as students with communicative disorders. So BMAC is broken up into six sub programs, if you will. So on the far left of the table there, we have Lois Shakarian Support Services. That is kind of our largest umbrella feature of our department in which any of the students classroom or campus accommodations are implemented. So once a student has um, their intake meeting, or we call it here on our campus, we call it a, um, a welcome meeting. Um, we ensure at support services that students kind of have a one-stop shop to the implementation of their accommodations. So support services, the largest service that we that we do provide is alternative testing accommodations for students with disabilities. So depending on the student's qualifications and diagnosis, they may um, be eligible for certain alternative testing accommodations, such as as extended time on exams, a distraction reduced setting in which to take their exams, even perhaps a private room in which to take their exams. Uh, perhaps they need to utilize uh, different assistive technology tools during exams, such as uh, text-to-speech uh, programs or speech-to-text programs um, and the like. Another large component of our support services program is our peer and assistive technology note taking services. So uh, students can be paired with a peer note taker in their course for qualifying diagnoses. Um, and essentially they serve as a supplemental kind of extra hand or um, or brain for notes. So we still expect our students to take you know their own notes to the best of their ability, but they also have that supplemental support in a peer note taker to kind of capture maybe things that might have been missed by the student. Um, some students, particularly those with learning disabilities or other impacts, may qualify for various assistive technology note-taking services such as um, Glean or Otter AI. So we also have those services here on campus, which essentially it's like a recording um, application program or uh, software or hardware that will capture the, the lecture content and help the student to produce uh, notes in that way. Um, other things that come into play can be, you know, preferential or priority seating in the classroom, um, you know, accommodations for campus events, um, and those sorts of things. We also partner with our Accessible Instructional Materials Center, again, to ensure that we're providing um, assistive technology as needed, as well as alternative or accessible media as needed. 
The Stephen Benson program is for folks with learning disabilities, um, as well as ADHD and ADD. So uh, this program can actually help provide off-campus referrals, um, as well as writing support for various services that students may qualify for with a learning disability um, or with ADD or, or ADHD. Uh, historically, we have also been able to provide uh, learning disability assessments in-house in our office within our program. Um, but with the pandemic, uh, at this time, we're not currently offering those LD assessments. So what we do for those students who are not yet diagnosed but suspect they may have a learning disability, uh, we do have a waiting list um, and an LD kind of screener application that we're working with right now to keep those folks on our radar and uh, in mind for when we're able to offer our LD assessments again. Um, and then again, we also have a referral list so they can seek outside support in getting diagnosed with a, you know, a suspected learning disability. The LIFE Project is a really exciting program that we have. Um, here at BMAC, and it stands for the Learning Independence for Empowerment Project. Um, that is a program for students with autism spectrum disorders, although other students in our program are welcome to, to be a part of this program and participate. Um, and we assist with the transition to college. So our students in the LIFE Project, they are paired with peer coaches who are, you know, student assistant interns who work with them on goals, whether they be short-term or long-term goals, academic or or socially kind of uh, oriented goals. Um, they have one-on-one -on -one meetings with their peer mentors to ensure that they're actually staying on track with their goals. And then there's also weekly group meetings on Friday with the whole program. Um, so they usually will involve um, inviting a guest speaker um, or another professional member on, on campus to speak about certain things. It could be, you know, um, uh, social nuances, dating advice, uh, cooking and nutrition skills, uh, you name it. We've kind of brought it over to the Life Project. And again, we just want to provide as much exposure um, to transitioning into adult independent life as possible. Um, an exciting change in addition to our Life Project program is that we now um, are providing job readiness programming. So we are really trying to cater services to prepare our students for um, a career after graduation. Um, our former director, Dave Sanfilippo, who used to always say it's good to get a degree, but it's better to get a job. Um, so we're kind of running with that and doing what we can to prepare our students for, you know, life after college. Uh, we do have a case management program. So uh, Cal State Long Beach actually has a handful of case managers scattered throughout the campus. And we're really lucky to have two that are housed directly within our department. So we have a generalist case manager as well as a mental health case manager. And they will work with our students who are in need, students who are in crisis, or just some students who need a little extra kind of um, care and monitoring to provide referrals to um, behavioral health uh, providers, financial support agencies, um, health care. Um, as well as social service agencies. Um, they can provide on and off campus referral support. And then of course we, we do have, you know, um, procedures in place to help students who are, you know, in immediate crisis um, situations. Our deaf and hard of hearing support services program. Um, Jessica, for, yes. Jessica, I'm sorry. Um, our translators I think are having a little trouble keeping up. <laughs> If oh, we I'm can so maybe sorry. Slow down just a little. Sure, no Thank problem you. at all. No Thank problem. You. Um, so we are at our deaf and hard of hearing support services program. Um, and that is similar to our more general Lois Shakarian support services program. However, um, it is, of course, catered to our students who are, you know, DHH students. Um, we have interpreters on campus, you know, ASL interpreters on campus. They are available both in face to face as well as um online modalities. And we also have um, our CART providers, so folks who provide real-time communication access to students. Um, so we have a whole, um, a whole separate slew of support services for our deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, and it's really interesting working with this population because there's, um, there's a culture associated with being a deaf student or a student who identifies as being, you know, hard of hearing. Um, and so it's really fascinating to learn about this group of um, people and, um, you know, we're trying to improve the visibility of this group of students um, here on our campus. 
And then I hinted to it before, um, but I will talk in more detail now about the Accessible Instructional Materials Center or the AIM Center. Um, that is our area on campus where we are able to provide accessible or alternative media to students with um, print impairments, such as students who might have a visual impairment or students who cannot otherwise access um, text in its print form. Um, we also have an area in that office that can provide um, accessibility training and support to staff and faculty on campus. Um, so our original goals for the program were to actually become a remediation center for the entire campus. So to collect anybody's documents that are inaccessible and make them accessible for the entire campus. Um, but our AIM Center staff is, is small but mighty and Lindsay who spoke at the beginning of tonight's program, um, she is part of the AIM Center. She's one of the staff members there. Um, we do what we can. So we are trying to kind of reframe our image to being um, a resource center for faculty and staff. So we have shifted more to, again, education and training related to accessibility to ensure that our staff members and our faculty members here on campus um, can ensure, you know, equal access to materials. Alrighty, so um, I'm so glad that LBCC, that Veronica and April went first because we actually have a lot of overlap in our presentations. Um, so I really want to kind of get into the difference between how accommodations might look at the K-12 level compared to college. Um, so here I have a table with three columns. Um, we have K-12 as it relates to IDEA. We have K-12 as it relates to the 504 plan. And then we have college, which um, is under 504, ADA, and FERPA. Um, so these are just a few items that I highlighted um, where you will notice distinct differences from the K-12 to the college level. There are more differences beyond the ones I listed here, but I didn't want my presentation to be um, a million jillion slides for everybody. So these are just some highlights that tend to um, tend to really stick out to people. And these are a lot of these are very um, common questions we get asked. So um, as was previously kind of mentioned in the other uh, the other presentation, uh, student records at the college level, they are not immediately accessible to parents or guardians. Um, they are only um, available to be released to the actual student who is enrolled, again, unless there is that release form on file. Um, for uh, K-12, there is a consideration for a behavior problem under IDEA, um, under a 504 plan, you know, the students are suspect or expected to um, follow the high school behavior code. Um, and then in college, similar to high school um, with uh, 504 plans, um, students are also expected to follow whatever the, the college or um, college code is or the code of conduct is. There's no consideration um, for behavioral problems. Um, a huge difference that can sometimes be hard to hear because it sounds very um, prescriptive in a way is that at the college level, you know, there's no guarantee for success. What is um, provided to students is a reasonable accommodation that provides equal access, but equal access does not necessarily guarantee success. So at the K-12 level, you know, there, there are a lot of supports in place. There's, you know, there's, um, there's teachers, there's administration, RSP folks, there's family, parents, you name it, to kind of be this team around the student. Um, and so there's a focus on not only providing access, but ensuring that they are successful. Um, at the college, again, I just want to highlight this is different. Um, you know, we, of course, will provide reasonable accommodations, but that does not guarantee the student's success. Um, you know, we, we, there is an expectation that students, you know, become independent at the university level. Um, a difference also in college compared to K-12 is that college services are not automatic. Um, so each college determines eligibility of services, um, and it can differ. So even, um, a, 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 let's say a community college that a student attended, let's say they transferred over to the university level, their accommodations from either institution may not even be the same as they were at that first institution. It really um, involves a thorough review of the student's uh, documentation as well as participation in the interactive process to determine reasonable uh, accommodations at each individual institution. Um, 
again, the student is responsible for their own, um, their own progress, the, their own implementation of their accommodations. So there is not going to be somebody at the university level who reaches out to the student to um, see whether they need an accommodation. Now, there could be faculty, let's say a student is in a course um, and a faculty is, is realizing that perhaps the student, you know, might be a student with a disability or maybe needs to get connected to services in some way. Faculty will refer students to our office, but again, it's not a requirement. Um, it really is up to the student to kind of take that first step towards self-advocacy to connect with our office and, and apply for and request services. Um, we always encourage students to connect with us if they feel that they may qualify for our service and services and benefit from them. But again, it, the responsibility does fall on the student um, to make that first connection with the office. Um, at the college level, um, similar to a 504 plan, um, there are no personal services provided um, beyond the reasonable accommodations. Um, any other services such as transportation, a personal attendant, a nurse or otherwise um, would be, you know, um, falling within the responsibility of the student to obtain. So those are just some key highlights and differences. And um, I definitely understand that they can seem pretty stark, especially when you're seeing them all on a table here in one place. Um, it definitely is a transition. Um, and we do our best to kind of communicate out to the general campus population, you know, that we're here um, and please connect with us. Um, just a little bit more about student responsibilities and the transition from K-12 to higher education. Um, at the university level, again, it is the student's responsibility to connect, register, and request accommodations with the university's disability access center. So in, in this case, it's it, it, uh, here at uh, Cal State Long Beach, it's BMAC. Um, it is the student's responsibility to disclose their accommodation needs and their BMAC status with instructors. And same like, um, like Veronica and April had shared at LBCC. Um, here at Cal State Long Beach, we do not disclose the student-specific disability to the, um, to the instructors. You know, they only know of the reasonable accommodation plan um, that is to be implemented. Um, and it's the student's responsibility to self-advocate. Um, we provide a lot of programming for our students, workshops, trainings, drop-in spaces, those sorts of things to help build those, those skills and provide those tools to the students so they can grow over time. Um, and become better self-advocates. Um, the tools are there. Again, it's just up to the student to kind of seek them out and to let us know when things aren't working or when more support might be needed. Um, and how can a student prepare for that transition from, from high school over to college? Um, it's really important that students are able to kind of identify their disability and how it may affect their learning or even their daily function. So if they have a good grasp, a good understanding of, of how their disability impacts them, that's always a good first step towards um, making that transition to college. Um, it's important for any student, regardless of disability status, to identify strengths in learning and to develop, you know, learning and study um, strategies to, to, you know, be as successful as you can in the classroom. You know, some students really thrive off um, memory aids and, th and things like that. Some students don't. We all learn in different ways, regardless of disability. Um, so it's important to kind of know our strengths and maybe our areas for improvement. Um, as a student, you know, it's, it's important to attend your IEP meetings if you have an IEP. Um, when you're not understanding what's happening during that meeting, it's, it's important to ask questions and, and to get clarity when you don't understand. Um, the reason I say this is because all of the meetings that will be had with BMAC should a student pursue, pursue Long Beach State and, and, and register with our office, you know, they are going to be the, the sole folks responsible for attending those meetings about them. So it's, it's always good practice to attend those IEP meetings and, and start, you know, asking those questions. Um, learn to work with peers and establish relationships. Um, there is a lot of collaborative work at Long Beach, regardless of major. Um, so it's just really great for students to start practicing those interpersonal skills and, and try to build some relationships to have, you know, a bit of a support system now that they're adults. Um, and then again, learn and practice those self-advocacy skills. It's, it can be hard at first. It can be hard for a while. Um, but the more that you practice and speak up for yourself, um, the easier things become. And that's what we try to um, impart uh, to our students. 
Um, a source for a lot of what I provided related to the difference between K-12 and college as well as the transition come from this Catching the Wave PDF from Grossmont College. Um, so I highly recommend um, everybody check that out. It's a free resource. I will put it in the chat too once I'm done speaking. Um, a lot of good information there. Again, I just couldn't fit everything into a handful of slides. And happy to open it up for any questions anybody may have. I don't know if the LBCC folks are still in here, but if anybody has more questions for them, we can, I, I think we have maybe a couple minutes to hold space for questions. Thank you, Jessica. It looks like Long Beach, um, Cal State Long Beach has a lot of services uh, for disabled students. I had no idea um, all the services they offer. So I'm super excited. Because um, when I drive past Cal State Long Beach, I tell my son that's where I went to school. And so I'm kind of hitting towards them. <laughs> It'd be, it's a great school. But thank you. I'm so, I mean, it looks like you have a lot of support there. And it looks like somebody made a comment that there was like a movie, like Autism Goes to College, that was filmed at Cal State Long Beach. Yes, there was. That was right around the time I actually joined back with the university. Prior to that, I actually was an LBUSD um, teacher. So, um, but yes, it is my understanding there is um, autism at college um, and parts of it were filmed here. And um, some of our, some of our campus community members were a part of that. And um, to answer another question, uh, Judy Carey wanted to know if the slides were available and I can make um, your slides available if that's okay with you for our group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, feel free to share um, whatever. I didn't make any additional changes. So whatever version I shared with you, um, you're, you're welcome to send that out. Okay. I just put the PDF, the Catching the Wave PDF about transition um, in the chat for anybody who wants to pull that. Okay. Just trying to make sure that there's if there's any questions for you. So I don't skip anybody. I don't think so. Thank you so much. Thank you for no problem thank at you all. so much for um, sharing. It, it really gives us a good idea what what's available for our kids, especially because we're you know we're, we're a little scared you know once they become more independent. But it's good to know that they have support in college. Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I I am always looking for opportunities to kind of broaden our outreach and our and our reach to folks. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly. It's easy to remember our emails because it's always just first dot last name at csulb.edu. Um, I'm also putting our general BMAC email address in the chat as well. Please feel to reach out with any follow up questions you may have. Um, and Katie, feel free to connect with me if um, there's a better way for me to get the um, presentation out to everybody. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Appreciate everybody. It. Appreciate it. Okay. So um, that's the conclusion of our um, higher education. Um, I think we're going to go on to good news. Oh, actually, I would like to, I guess, um, Dr. Heenan, if she would like to present about what's upcoming for um, in the district for resources for our kids. There's some programs available. Katie. Before I do that, I really want to thank you, first of all, and the, the board for putting on this presentation tonight. It was amazing and so powerful. Um, and I know that there was a lot of work and time put into it. So again, um, thank you and thank to our students and families for participating. Um, it's always, I think, so impactful when we hear their voices. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I know that Dr. Owens has shared in um, the um, chat, um, he's been sharing the agenda. And then in addition to the agenda, there is some opportunities for, um, you know, parent training throughout the district. Some of them are from the Office of Special Education, and then some of them are just um, put on by Parent University and the district. But I wanted to make sure that everybody did have um, this information. And then, um, oh, thanks, Dr. Owens. And I'm just going to, is it okay, Katie, if I share for one second? Yes, yes, I would love for you to share. Okay, perfect. So let me just go ahead and open this up, share screen. Um, okay, so this is the information that is um, attached right below the agenda in the file. And it's, there's information here on upcoming workshops that are put on um, by the district. So there's some on grief and loss, a focus on wellness, 
Um, there's information on the high school choice fair, which will be right around the corner um, for our parents who are looking at options for high schools. Um, and there's time um, to connect with Dr. Baker um, November 9th. So these are just general um, presentations that are put on by, by the district. There's also some um, informational meetings for parents related to special education topics that have been requested. And again, um, the links are attached. So all you have to do is click on the link and we'll get you access to these trainings. And one of the most important things um, are the next two slides. And I know that in the past we've talked about CAC, the meetings really being for the families and for the general um, public and information for the, for the general public as a whole. But we know that there's also time where you want to talk about your own children and some concerns you might have um, and that you want to speak to your special ed administrator specifically. And so what we've done is we've set up an hour um, before every CAC meeting to go ahead and have some private like office hour time with your special ed administrator. So what, so what this is right here is this was created by one of our special ed administrators, um, Norman, which is amazing. So what this is, is you're going to go ahead, go ahead and look down at the school sites lifted, listed. And if your child attends, say, Hamilton, you're right here, you would be um, supported by Dr. Mary Beth Murray. And you would go ahead and just click on her little emoji, her little picture, and it will open up a Zoom link. And then that Zoom link, you would be able to have about, an, you know, have some time with Dr. Murray to talk about any questions you have, any concerns that you're facing at the school site or where you might need support from us um, with your child's school. So again, this is every, um, before every CAC meeting, um, we'll have this opportunity from 4.30 to 5.30. And so please do take advantage of this time because that's where you'll be able to talk specifically about your child and some concerns. So um, I just wanted to put, put that out there. And the last um, training series we have, and this is kind of backed by popular demand, um, is Mr. Anderson, Mike Anderson, put on a beautiful training series um, well before COVID. And, and it's specifically for parents and how they can um, work with their children to de-escalate some challenging behaviors. He um, talks about the power of listening, managing your own anger, setting limits. So if you haven't attended or if you'd like to attend again, just to get a refresher, he's going to go ahead and offer these sessions throughout the year. So just wanted to make sure everybody had these opportunities. Um, if you're available, please go ahead and log on. And uh, it's just a little bit of outreach that we were hoping to provide to the community. Thank you, Katie, for your time. And again, beautiful facilitation tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heenan. Um, so I um, would like to give some time for public um, comments. Um, so for good news, shout outs, um, any public comments to give um, parents to a chance. Um, so if, I'll see if anybody's raising their hand. I have a hard time with this. Like, I, guess I have to scroll. Does anybody see any, anybody who would like to have any good shout, any shout outs? Robin has three hands on. Robin. <laughs> okay, good. Go ahead, Robin. I can't believe I was muted. Number one, you guys, I'm so proud of this CAC board. I mean, I'm blown away by tonight's meeting. And um, Katie, I know you did so much work doing the interviewing and the speakers and so, so proud. I feel like a proud mom. Um, but I do have good news because, and this is the perfect meeting topic all about self-advocacy and getting our kids ready for that transition to college where we are going to be kicked out of the rooms. Um, but um, I had my son attend his first IEP meeting. He's in third grade. And I he was in there and I told the team, he was in there for the whole thing. And I, I told the team, I was like, he's here because he needs to see the work that we do to support him. Also, it'll change the way I talk about him because he'll be sitting right there and it'll change the way you guys talk about him because he will be sitting right there. And it was a wonderful meeting. 
And, um, you know, he did have some input. Not all of it was useful, but, you know, not all of my input is useful. So, but it was really positive and um, I'm so grateful for his team and I encourage you all to do it. Um, it adds the most important voice to the table, even if that voice is annoyed and wanting to go home and eat ice cream. So um, again, bravo to all the student speakers and, um, and uh, the CAC board you guys are fantastic, doing so great. And um, thank you, that was my good news. I'm glad to. That's awesome, Robin. I think I'll consider doing that. I haven't done it yet um, to have my son present at a meeting. Uh, but he is in fourth grade, so it probably is time to to start having him part of it. Rip the Band-Aid off. I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tenemos más tiempo para comentario público. Los papás que we have say. more time for public comment. The parents that wish to do so, it's your time. It's your space. And if anybody else needs help. When is the next meeting? The next meeting is uh, November 10, and we're going to have uh, two sessions for IEP. First one is just the basic information on what it's an IEP, how does it look like, and, and you know, all responsibilities as parents and how we learn it. And then the second part of the session is going to be all the agencies and support services that can help the district and outside this district, like Harbor Regional or other uh, advocates that can support parents on um you know, getting the best of our IEP. So that will be uh, November the 10th. Thank you, Magda. And just quickly, um, I know that um, everybody's time is limited, but I did want to acknowledge we have a lot of support on this um, meeting tonight from our board members. Um, I don't know if you've had a moment to look around, but we've had Mr. Otto on, we have Mrs. Kerr, Mrs. Craighead, Dr. Benitez, I don't know if um, Mr. Miller is here, but because I've been scrolling through, we also have Dr. Camarino on here, who's our assistant superintendent for high schools. So um, I'm sure there's more people on here, but I just want to thank you and personally for, for taking the time to come to our meetings and always supporting our families and, and students with disabilities. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Yes, I'll, I'll second that. Thank you so much for coming and supporting us. Gracias por todo el equipo que está aquí presente de administradores. Thank you for all the team of administrators here present. I thank you all. And I also know we have uh, Hispanic parents. If you have any doubt, concerns, we have other parents with you. And I know that last time we didn't have time. So now we're giving you this time. We're being respectful so that the parents have this time, the space for you for co comments. And, and, and I think the district as well, uh, I have seen that through the meeting, uh, some uh, questions have already been answered and the administrator for a specific school reached out to the parents. So thank you for that in advance. And um, just to close out, I, I really, really appreciate and Katie, excellent work. This has been a, a very hard uh, thing to put together. Uh, when we created a calendar, we were just like brainstorming about it and you just really took it on. And I know it was a lot of work and I really appreciate this meeting. It really makes me dream of the future for my kid that he can go to college and, and, and be successful. So I think, we're, I think we're gonna close on time, aren't we? Amazing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to share? This is your moment. Es el tiempo para compartir. Uh, it's están... time to share. The majority of the administrators are here. Take advantage, parents. Okay, then. Bien, tenemos dos minutos. We have two minutes. I want to thank all the administrators. Thanks, Katie, for this presentation. To all the students, Celia has a question. Yes, uh, good evening. I'm Celia Peña. I have left my comment. 
and I hope you hear my concerns and hope every someone gets in communication with me. I left my information and I hope that you could help me. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. One more minute. I can't see if somebody else needs to say something. I would like to thank um, Dr. Heenan and Dr. Prilo um, for helping with this meeting. Um, I've been in contact with both of them and they've been very supportive. So I just would like to thank um, our administrative um, team. Maria, a mí me gustaría comentar algo. Tal vez no Maria, si... I would like to make a comment. I don't know if it would be a public comment or as a concern. Good. It's eight o'clock. Thank all of you. I don't think the parents have a comment. Tiempo y la dedicación que se están aquí. Yo sé que muchos. Oh, okay. Adelante. Viene. Okay. Sorry, viene. Maria, I don't know if this is a comment or a concern. Jane, I don't think you're muted. You, you muted the original language. I know there was a participation before the meeting. I'd like to know how much is a reasonable time for a parent to wait for help with their student when it's been more than 30 days. I don't know if any of the administrators, I know Mr. Dennis is present from my department. I know the administrator for Twain is present. If you put your information in the chat uh, again, we can reach out to you and talk specifically about your situation. Okay, let me go ahead and do that. I think you maybe said you did, but I, I don't. I tried to look for it, I couldn't find it. <laughs> So um, I hope the parents in the group um, take advantage of the time that we get to meet with our administrators um, before um, each CAC meeting, because um, they're making themselves available to us, which I we thought was an excellent idea, um, that they're um, more accessible. So hopefully we take advantage of meeting with them. Um, you can always notify them um, ahead of time if you need to, um, but if you have some concerns specific to your kid, uh, it's a great opportunity to talk to the administrators. Before we sign Gracias, off, Katie. Katie. Uh, Thank you, Katie. I was going to say, before, before we sign off, I want to thank our translators Adelante. who worked double duty tonight. <laughs> and yeah. uh, just a stellar job always. Thank you, thank you, thank you, translators. I also would like to uh, thank um, Gracias, Chris Dr. Edson. Owens for um, doing the Spanish interpretation for the video, for Lindsay's video. Um, that was to me really important that that took place. So our Spanish speakers would be able to understand her. So thank you very much for all your support too, um, with helping with everything for the meeting tonight. Gracias por tener el intérprete thank you for having double interpreter next time we failed at that, but thank you for having the team ready and we could do a better job and the parents can express themselves way better. 
Thank you, Dr. Rachel, for making every effort possible to have the whole team here. Yes, thank you for all who are in prison here could hear it. And it's very important that we all learn for, about all the services and especially hear our students' voice. And I'll stay with this. A paper does not define my child. It's more than a paper. And I hope the teachers and professionals here hear their voice. They are more than a paper. Believe me, a paper does not define the disability of a child. It's more than that. And like, for example, my daughter, there's there, Anna. She was one of the speakers. She's more than a paper. A paper does not define her. She keeps working and has resilience to move on. Even with all the obstacles and bullying, the people that didn't believe in her, she believed in herself. Thank you and good night to all. Excelente trabajo. Gracias por escuchar y gracias por escuchar a nuestros estudiantes. Excellent work. Thank you for listening and listening to our students.